Movies coming out March the 23rd. Can we once again welcome the great Jim Caviezel in the house? Such an honor to have you here, buddy. I know you've been at Liberty before. The last time you were in town, uh, you were promoting uh, a little movie by the name of The Passion of the Christ. And uh, many of us have obviously seen that, one of the uh, highest grossing films of all time. And um, right off the bat, you have uh, certainly made a decision as a, a, a Hollywood uh, heavyweight, you know, to, to leverage your uh, fame, to be a part of redemptive movies. Uh, you've uh, played Christ in, in, in that particular movie, and then um, now you've chosen to play uh, the, the, the role of Luke in, in this movie. Uh, what makes you want to be a part of these kind of movies? Well, um, guys, uh, we hold the truth. They don't hold the truth. And our Lord gave me an opportunity to do something with it. Much of the time when we get to a certain level of power people uh, Turn on our Lord when I first came in to the business Jesus held me like a little bit lamb He held me. I did not know where to go I had the call to to be an actor But it was going to take him to teach me to bring me to the right teachers and to the right films to do but in, at some point I had to make the decision what films to choose and I recently heard James Faulkner who plays Saul and Paul he said I did not play this guy it played me and that was my prayer for him because that same thing happened when I was doing the movie and the passion I said I don't want the world to see me I want them to see you Lord what, what good would it be for them to convert to me and have me lead them in error I want them not to follow my sin. I want them to follow the Messiah. That's amazing. Yeah. Jim, you, you grew up in a Christian home, uh, a devout believer. And, and, um, and when you were 19, uh, you felt like the Lord was calling you uh, to go into acting. And then past that, uh, obviously, you had a, a great career. And then uh, Mel Gibson chose you for the film, yeah. Passion of the Christ. Take us back to that just before we start talking about the Paul movie. Uh, well, some of you may have heard the story, but it's true. Um, I had a, 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 a deep uh, experience that happened when I was about 19 years old in a theater, and I heard the, the it was from God. And some of you guys have probably already had those happen to you, but mine was I felt this love that I never felt before, this peace I never felt before, and I heard the God say, "I'd like." you to be an actor exactly every night I went to bed and I would it was like an indelible mark written on my heart every morning I woke up I'd like you to be an actor so uh, I was probably 28 years old when I got the thin red line and after that point it was a smorgasbord of films you could choose so I was just always as an actor, as a professional, you know, you look through what kind of material do you like? And at some point I got a phone call from my agent telling me that Mel Gibson would like to meet with me, but it was kind of, it was, it was not the standard kind of meeting. And actually it was a surfing movie I was meeting on uh, called Mavericks. And uh, Kevin Reynolds, who directed me in the Count of Monte Cristo was probably going to direct this. I'd like to introduce you to the Count of Monte Cristo yet again. <laughs> um, so, we <laughs> so we go into this uh, meeting and uh, I'm, I'm about 40 minutes in and Mel Gibson shows up and he starts talking about different things and I suddenly have this shot back to when I was 19 years old at this point I uh, I said wait this isn't a surfing film my heart started burning and I said you want me to play Jesus don't you and he looked at me he was smoking a cigarette and he goes yeah I looked down and I said okay and so two days later I was I never forget it. I was in my kitchen I was taking the garbage out and uh, the phone rings and I said, hey, hello. And it says, hey, Jim, it's Mel. I said, Mel, Mel who? He says, I don't know, Mel Brooks, hey. <laughs> so you still wanna play this Jesus guy? 
And I said, yes. And he says, if you do it, you may never work in this town again. And I got quiet and I felt fear come into me. That's one thing about our faith. When you feel that, that's not Jesus. Then he put his uh, hand over the phone. There was a long pause and he, I could hear him muffling uh, through the phone. I could hear him say, he's not going to do it. And I, at that point, then I could feel the difference of something come through me that was great love. And it was, look, man, we're all called to carry our cross. If you don't pick up and carry your cross, you will be crushed by the weight of it. And he got silent. And then I said, oh, my God. He said, what? I said, I just realized my initials are JC and I'm 33 years old. He says, God, you're freaking me out. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> but that's what happened. I mean, it really happened. And we go on the film and it was this long, you know, coming to conversion that I was going to have to suffer. And that's what began to happen. The shoulder separation, the cross, the, the cold, the hypothermia, the lung infection, being struck by lightning, the uh, open heart surgery. Uh, you know, I was messed up. But what happened was when I was on the cross, and I could just barely take it. And, you know, I mean, I'd get up there. They'd tie me up, put me in. And it was near a thousand foot cliff. So I already was struggling with my shoulder. And every time the wind, you know, it was like a Grand Canyon would come over maybe at three knots and all of a sudden it increased at 20, 30 knots. The cross would snap and it would rip my shoulder out. And at one point, you know, I'd, I'd had breakfast in the morning. You had to eat because you were so cold, but then I'd throw up and, and it was just constant. And then, um, this guy from uh, um, Ken, he was from Australia, a friend of Mel's, and he goes, hey, Jim, Jim, come here. I, go, oh, man. And I said, you have to come up here, pal, I'm in pain. So they brought up a thing and he put this uh, earphones on it, and that's where he played the song Above All. And I just listened to it over and over and over again. My heart started to burn. I mean, burn inside. I had tears coming out and I was in it. And at that point, a whole day was gone in 10 minutes. It just, it took, it put me in a zone and took me out of my pain. It took me out of my feeling sorry for myself or any of that. And it took me into heaven. And even in all this suffering, man, evil has no power over us at all. Wow. Take us to this new movie and uh, there's, uh, you play the, the, the role of Luke. We know in scripture that, uh, that Luke visited the Apostle Paul when he was in the Mamertine prison. And um, take, take us into that dynamic and that relationship uh, and what it means to you. So there's no, uh, in certain films, you'll, you'll watch a guy and, and you get to see that how he talks and his mannerism. And so you, there's a bit, bit of impersonation involved. Uh, you know, one time I was looking at uh, Ronald Reagan, something on him and, and I was, well, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny, you know, and you start to, to learn that stuff. For, um, and then um, in this one, there's no recordings of it, but I started with him from uh, the Saul has a conversion into Paul, a so-called believer, a man that is fervent in his beliefs, but no love, right? And then you have this other guy who's lacking, has everything. He has the wealth. Uh, he's, he's a doctor, a Greek, and, and I'm sure very prestigious in his area, yet he was lacking something that, you know, for example, if I was in Hollywood and I had attained all, you know, homes and money and everything, and I had that lack of love in my heart, I would feel empty. And you see many people that have had that, all the things, and yet they commit suicide why there's this emptiness there and there was a uh, the hook in the film to me was where um w when i saw uh, i never met christ in person but when i saw you i you know i saw christ in you it, it he became real and then then i think about that piece and then said well um you know uh, the world would look at this and say oh biblical movie but this is relevant now 
just having watched the movie and just being moved by it, you're right. It's such, uh, it's such a reminder, this movie, of the scandalous love and forgiveness of God. Uh, we have this scene uh, from the movie where um, Paul and Luke are having a conversation and, um, and Paul is charging Luke about that kind of uh, controversial, scandalous love and forgiveness. Let's watch this together and I want to get some of your thoughts. Wow. <laughs> Write it down. And that's exactly what Luke did. The gospel is just so entrenched in this movie. Jim. I mean, there are these secondary themes like the persecution of the church. There's the theme of friendship between Luke and Paul. But certainly the biggest takeaway has to be in this movie, the gospel. Uh, he takes a lot of heat for doing these kind of movies. But at the same time, I told him he's among brothers and sisters who appreciate him for, for, for leveraging. Can we thank Jim? Man, brother, we love you. We're for you. We're praying for you. Thank you. Let's watch this clip about influence uh, of, the, of the Apostle Paul. Such a powerful movie. Uh, I know you have a final thought on your heart before we bring the distinguished panel out to talk a little bit more about the Apostle Paul. I live very close to the Ronald Reagan Library. And um, here's a man, an extraordinary story. I, I put him up there with Abe Lincoln. He had to fight against... One of the greatest evils that ever was that killed over 150 million people if we put Mao, 60 million. Eastern Europe, that behind the Iron Curtain, our bosses, our leaders collaborated with evil. They chumped up this word called detente, the coexistence of communism and capitalism but, and we, yet freedom was losing we were losing our liberty we were losing he, he said that Reagan said that um, detente detente isn't that what a farmer does with his turkey all year long until Thanksgiving day what do we say to our brothers and sisters now caught behind their iron curtain Give up your dreams of freedom now because in order to save our own skins we're just too willing to make a deal with your slave masters do you and i have the courage to say there is a price we will not pay there is a point beyond which evil must not advance he would go on to say that evil is powerless if the good are unafraid well you and i have a rendezvous at destiny we'll preserve for our children this the last best hope of man on earth I will sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose this war, and in so doing lose this great way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those that had the most to lose did the least to prevent it from happening. Well, I think it's high time now that we ask ourselves if we still even know the freedoms that were intended for us by our founding fathers. Every generation of Americans needs to know that freedom exists, not to do what you like, but having the right to do what you ought. And that is the freedom that I wish for you. Set yourselves apart from this corrupt generation. Be saints. You weren't made to fit in. You are born to stand out. God bless you. Wow. Thank you, buddy. So good. Man. Man. It's awesome, brother. You're more, you're more than just a brother in Christ, man. You are a patriot and honestly, just a, a, a freedom fighter. And we're grateful for you. Can we just one more time thank Jim before our panel comes out? Thank you, buddy.